about um, are you happy about your exam three work if you've completed it if you've completed part of it uh, if you have um, any questions that you want to chat about <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. I'm glad. I figured it was fun. I figured you guys had the best time ever. Um, okay, so um, on the assumption that um, any, any chat about the material from the last exam uh, can, can wait, um, let's go ahead and start talking about our last Boohoo module. Um, oh, but, sorry, bef before we start talking about um, quantifier logic, um, please know that I, as I look at my schedule, I'm thinking that I will be able to have your, to have read your uh, exam work um, at the very latest or by the very latest on Sunday. I'm thinking that I can get to it Part of it, maybe all of it tomorrow. I don't know, but certainly through over the weekend. Um, know also that if there is, uh, if you want to um, retest any exam, so right that would be for for right now one, two, and three. It should be the case that those exams are open. Let me know if you have questions, um, but also know that if it's not already clear. Um, there's no there's no harm in retesting uh, an exam. I take whichever of your two scores is best. So let's suppose that um, you decide just for fun you want to retest an exam even though your original exam score is is perfect. It's a hundred percent. And then for some reason you know something goes wrong. You you misread something or whatever. I don't know and you don't have a, a perfect score on your retest, it's not like I'm going to keep your retest score. So there's no harm, no foul. Okay, so that said, um, what, I, what I thought we could do is this. I'm gonna yap at you a bit, but of course, um, give, you know, let me know if you have questions as I'm yapping. Um, I try to keep my eyes on intermittently <laughs> this uh, the screen that that has the PowerPoint and then the screen that has our um, our zoom uh, population our zoom room um, so let me know if you have questions and then what we'll do is we'll start working on learning by doing so I'm going to I'm going to flip the the way that we typically approach things which is normally we talk about we do some learn by doing and then we go back in and look at the technical concepts what I'm going to do now is introduce some technical concepts. Um, should be the case that a lot of what we're saying is it looks familiar to you. Um, and that's because although we are introducing some new notation, it's not the case that everything that we're talking about is brand new. It builds on what we've discussed before. All right, so... Yes. Okay, thanks. I just want to make sure because otherwise you're still... Thank you, everybody. Uh, otherwise, you're still seeing yourselves. Okay, so as a reminder, if we go all the way back to basically to day one, I think that's when we, we started talking in very uh, broad strokes uh, from the, the, the standpoint of uh, how we're going to proceed. Um, we said, hey, we're talking about the logical structure of, of sentences where a sentence is uh, defined as uh, an utterance that is true or false, right? So, you know, we can talk about descriptive sentences where we're trying to describe a state of affairs. We can talk about prescriptive sentences where we're talking about um, what should or ought to be the case, right? Um, we also said that those sentences are either simple, atomic, or compound, and we started, of course, with atomic sentences, and then we began compounding them. But we also said, now this is where the chapter nine stuff is gonna start to come into play. We also said that we are gonna spend a lot of time talking about singular sentences. And even if we didn't um, 
articulate a sentence in singular terms, we would, let's say in propositional logic, treat the sentence as singular, which is to say a singular, we were treating sentences as sentences about, you know, this individually named, you know, individual, person, place, thing, creature, whatever. So that's uh, what we're talking about in terms of this first bullet point, right? We know that A is a dodec is a sentence uh, about this named entity A and what we say about it or its property of, of being a dodec. Um, we can also talk about individually, uh, or, sorry, um, singular sentences, that is individually named things um, in compound sentences. So I can say Al is adorable and Shazi is sweet, right? Now what we're going to do is not ign ignore those singular sentences, but rather add to our repertoire, but, but with the focus on what we do when we're not naming entities, right? So we're going to talk about groups of things or classes of things, um, unspecified things. So take a look at uh, the following examples. All dogs bark, cats and dogs are animals, no logic exercises are easy, some dogs are not friendly. Uh, these are examples of what we're going to call quantified sentences. So a quantified sentence is a, a sentence uh, that uh, ranges over uh, uh, unnamed, unspecified entities in terms of the entirety of the group or uh, a part of the group. So all dogs bark says is the, the quantified sentence um, involving a universal, right? Why is it a universally uh, quantified sentence? Because we're talking about every single creature in the dog category. If you jump down to the third example, we also have a universal uh, sentence, a universally quantified sentence. Um, but here, instead of the every single one in the affirmative, we're saying every single one in the negative. So we have universally quantified sentences that are affirmative or negative. And then we also have existentially quantified sentences uh, that are also affirmative or negative. The example, some dogs are not friendly, is an existential negative, which is to say we're, we're talking about at least one dog that's not friendly, right? So um, if you've done any work in um, uh, categorical logic, uh, I'm thinking specifically about any critical thinking course at, in our, um, at our college, it's, it's Phil Six Logic and Practice, right? Where uh, you uh, would have... Uh, talked about um, things like the, uh, the square of opposition and you would have worked on categorical syllogisms. If you've done any of that, then, then bring that, that uh, understanding to bear here. All right. So far, so good, I hope. But again, I'm, I'm ranging over our tiles in our Zoom room. And, it, and I'm also looking out for um, uh, chat messages. You, you let me know if you need me to uh, stop or repeat or whatever. Okay, so let's think about how we're working as follows. We are still working on atomic sentences and compound sentences, but now our focus is on unnamed entities, which brings us to the uh, quantifier types, right? The universal or existential. So if we look back, if we look down on our last, uh, at our last two bullet points, we see that when we're talking about a universal claim, we're talking, we're going to notate that with an upside down A. And when we're talking about an existentially quantified claim, that's going to be uh, notated with a backward E. So let's talk about how that uh, is going to look 
uh, as soon as we get to talking about um, what we do with the unnamed stuff, right? So remember um, the, the before, let me just go back a, a slide. Remember with the examples, A is a doe deck, Al is adorable, Shazi is sweet, right? In parentheses, we have names. Well, now in quantifier logic, we don't have names. That's what we mean when we talk about unspecified entities. And part of the way that we are going to uh, notate that this new uh, sentence type is by way of the universal or the existential quantification symbol. But then we also need to talk about what we put in place of a name. So we're going to talk about variables or um, what I'm going to call, what I'm going to refer to also as placeholders. So um, let's think about the, the uh, claims, um, uh, lot, or sorry, the, the claims horses are fleet footed and logic students are smart. If I want to say Mr. Ed is, a horse and Mr. Ed is fleet footed, right? No worries on the name, we've got Mr. Ed. But when we're talking about horses, full stop, the, the class of entity that is called a horse, right? We've got no names, right? Unspecified entities, but our domain of, of discourse is horses and fleet footed things. So the thinginess is going to be uh, captured in the parenthetical by a variable. And we're going to use lowercase letters, T through Z. Most often you'll see X and Y and maybe to a lesser um, uh, extent C, or sorry, Z. Similar with, with logic students are uh, smart. I can say, you know, Deb is a logic student and Deb is smart. Evan is a logic student and Evan is smart. Ivan is a logic student and Ivan is smart. Tyler is a logic student and Tyler is smart. Dereje is a logic student. Dereje is smart. Kate is a logic student. Kate is smart. Michael is a logic student and Michael is smart. Chloe is a logic student and Chloe is smart. Elizabeth is a logic student and uh, Elizabeth is smart. And I think, oh, sorry, Lewis. I think I overlooked Lewis is a logic student and Lewis is smart, right? So we've named each and every one of you, I hope, and yell at me if that's not true. Did I get you, Ivan? Yeah. Yay. Okay. Right. So so on the assumption that, that I've named each person in the group, I've got a, multiple singular statements, right? But when I don't name any of you, I'm going to say, you know, for, for everything uh, in the universe, that's uh, a logic student, it, that student, or the, sorry, that entity is smart. So now I, I don't have names, I've got my variables, okay? So here we go. Let's start with the examples, um, if you would. We'll, we'll slide back up to the, to the initial bullet points. So the example, uh, first example says something is a dodec. The second example says everything is small. Notice we've got two atomic sentences. Why do we have two atomic sentences? Because we have no connectives. So here's how we can read the sentence. Something is a dodec. Existential X, dodec X. Here's another way that we can read that sentence back out into ordinary English, right? So instead of the sentence, something is a dodec, we're going to read the, the quant, um, the logically notated sentence back out. There is something, that thing is a dodec. Now let's look at the second example. Everything is small. Universal X, small x. Now let's read back out. For everything in the universe, that thing is small. Or for everything, that thing is small. Let's think now uh, about, if you will, kind of the universe of stuff, and we'll talk about this more in a bit, but what I want us to think about is the, the way in which each of these sentences carves out a domain of discourse, right? When we're saying, so, uh, sorry, let me back out of that. When we're saying everything is small, we can depending on what we take the scope 
of the domain of discourse to be everything in the universe is small, or we're saying everything within a restricted uh, group is small, right? So one of the things that's nice about quantifier logic in terms of moving from English to notate to logical notation is we gain some clarity about the scope of our domain of discourse, right? So we're sort of carving out uh, our logical structure. And I hope that as we move forward, that will be clear. Let me give you an example of what I mean by carving that uh, domain out. When we get to chapter 11, we're gonna introduce uh, multiple quantifiers. So suppose that I want to talk about all these dogs and all those dogs. In ordinary English, right, I have the, the reference language these, those, but in logic, you know, I don't. I have to make that reference. So we're gonna wanna talk about how we carve that domain of discourse up by way of um, as explicitly as possible notating uh, in terms of not just the quantifier, but also uh, the the variables, right? Making sure that we don't prote that we don't make the mistake of allowing our logic to uh, conflate variables. More on that later. Okay, so um, let's go now back up to the um, first bullet point. If oh, sorry, Dev, what are you thinking? Yeah, I was wondering, how do you know if it's a variable or a, a, a constant or a name? Great question. Okay, so in our version of the system, we stipulate that names are going to be the lowercase a through, so let's just say, sorry, let me back out of that. that. Let's focus on Tarski's world, where we have six possible names. There, the stipulation is a name is lowercase letter A through F, right? Correct. Okay. But, you know, in practice, if we step outside of Tarski's world, it would be, you know, lowercase anything we want. So, so what I mean by that is this. Let me go back to my original um, slide. And we have Al and Shazi. Right. Al and Shazi don't exist in Tarski's world, right? We can't notate that at least by way of the buttons, and we couldn't build a world in which Al and Shazi and sweetness and adorableness are are um, buildable, right? But we understand that they're names because of our naming convention. So you have like Dodec A above that. Yeah. And it doesn't have a quantifier in front of it. Right. If I that, can I assume that that's just uh, a variable? No, here's why. We've stipulated in our version of the system that the lowercase letter A is a name. It's the name A. Okay. Yeah, right. great question. Yeah, so but It's going according to what we did with Tarsi's world before. Right, right. And now, and I know what I'm about to say is going to sound super snotty, and I promise I don't mean it this way, but when you go back into Tarski's world and you want to generate variables, you'll see that you've got T through Z at your disposal. So that then says to you, oh, that's what I'm going to use. Okay. Right? So, I mean, like one of the things that, that I, I really appreciate about your question is, is you're saying, is there some sort of like fundamental ultimate nature of reality about that 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 uh, we capture in this language and the answer is no it's stipulated right but but when we stipulate when we say okay we are going to say that lowercase x is an unnamed entity we follow that becomes a, a principle a rule that we follow throughout does that mean that in every possible universe that we could create or that is that exists that that's the case? No, not necessarily. Right? Okay. So so this is conventional, but the convention is still meant to reflect some kind of fundamental way things are. So which is to say, I could stipulate that A is always a, a variable. Okay. And that's supposed to reflect unnamed entity. 
Oh, okay. okay. But I didn't do that because the book told me not to. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. I was just wondering if it didn't have a quantifier in front of it, can you just assume that it was a name? Great, great question. And the answer is no. So, so now we come back to, let's look at this first bullet point. So, so I, the way that you're thinking, Deb, is great because you're anticipating what's going to be a well-formed formula. So take a look at uh, the first bullet point on this slide do, and see Dodec X. So, so what I'm about to say is, may, is, is going to um, presuppose more meaning than is expressed by the word dodec and then the parenthetical x, okay? That says entity dodec. But it's not a well-formed formula. Why? Because this goes back to your point, there's no quantifier in front of dodec. So we don't know how many entities. Are we talking about every entity? Right? Or are we talking about at least one? So in order to have a well-formed formula, you need to have a quantifier that provides us with, with the scope. At least the, the uh, well, quantity if scope. If you just have dodec x, that doesn't say anything. It doesn't say anything. Yeah. Okay, go. This is, this is what is um, uh, often called a statement function, but it doesn't actually give us any, it doesn't say yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Okay. All right, you. of course. What do we think? How are you guys doing? So far, so good. Okay, so we've got we've got uh, um, two types of quantified sentence. Yeah, you know, right. Universal and and existential. And then we've got for for each type, we've got affirmative and negative. And so far, we've got um, uh, the the notation for an atomic. Uh, quantified sentence. Um, so now let's talk about how we end up with a compound uh, quantified oh. sentence. So when you have multiple classes of thing, you are going to need to relate them, not just in terms of quantity and quality, which is how much and affirmative or negative, but also in terms of a connective that provides us with an articulation of that relation. So let me read to you um, the, the, uh, another way. Sorry, let me back out of that. Let me read to you the, the examples and how we uh, articulate the um, notated, the logically notated sentence, and then also how we can uh, provide another reading back out into English. All horses are equines. Universal X, open paren, horse, X variable, arrow, equine, X variable, close paren, which is to say, if it, unnamed entity, if it's a horse, then it's an equine. Here's another way to read it. For every X, if that X is a horse, then that X is an equine. So notice that all horses are equines becomes if, then. Hence, we have our arrow sentence. Notice also that the grammatical subject becomes notated in terms of a predicate. And then you get, in terms of the stuffy stuff of the universe, right, you get your unnamed entities. So we've got the stuff in the universe that's horse stuff, the stuff in the universe that's equine stuff. Similarly, we've got some dogs are beagles, existential X, open paren, dog uh, X, conjunction beagle X, close paren. There is something that is a dog and a beagle, or there is at least one thing that thing is a dog as well as a beagle. So we've got our conjunction. And by the way, these two uh, translations are the standard. We'll look at that in, in just a little bit, but just as a heads up, these two are the standard translations for respectively your 
universal affirmative and existential affirmative. Now, just to push on where we're going in um, chapter 11, take a look at the, the third example. Every cube is smaller than something. Notice we can, in our ordinary English, we, we make uh, um, uh, quantified sentences in terms of, of comparing uh, quantities of thing with great regularity. Um, we can have really complicated, multiply quantified sentences, right? And here the notation is uh, nested, and we'll so we'll talk about what that how we how we generate those sorts of um, uh, translations when we get into chapter eleven. But this is just a I hope a nice heads up. Um, does it make sense to say? Uh, so now bring your eyeballs back on up to the the two uh, the first two examples. Does it make sense to say that the parentheses are are sorry rephrase the parentheses function in a way that similar to how they function when let's say we have a negation out front of a sentence right. The parentheses here tell us what the scope of the quantifier is. So that universal x ranges across each x within the parenthetical. The existential x ranges across each x in the parenthetical. And then, just for fun, let's drop down to the universal x in the third example ranges across each x in the parenthetical. And then the nested existential y, it's nested within the, the arrow sentence, right? That existential y covers the y in the um, uh, parentheses related to the variables. Right. So let's just pause for a moment to say, uh, at least I hope it makes sense to you guys um, to say, oh yeah, we're not really doing a whole lot more that's different from what we're already doing. We're just sort of adding on to what we know. Right. So we're scooping up and bringing forward all the stuff that we learned way back starting from chapter one. Okay. Um. One note that I want to also throw out, uh, we can talk about this more, but I just want to throw it out there for, for, for you to file away, is this, namely that um, the, we won't have for the quantifiers truth tables like we have for um, singular sentences that are governed by connectives. What we can do is um, effectively um, offer instances of a completed universally quantified uh, claim in the singular and then build truth tables for that. Uh, well, we can talk about that later. Instead, let's just say that quantified statements are going to be generally true or false relative to the domain of discourse or uh, quantification in, uh, at issue. So universally quantified. So think about how we would understand uh, the truth or falsity of a universally quantified sentence. Right? So if we want to say everything in the universe is good, right? someone might say, well, that's not true. There are some things in the universe that aren't good, and, and there we go with it having a conversation about the relative truth or falsity of a, a given universally quantified sentence. Right? The more restricted universally quantified sentence, um, it may be less controversial, uh, but let's think about, for example, what um, scientists want to do. They want to generate a, enough bod, enough knowledge within a body of knowledge to be able to uh, assert sort of law-like claims, right? So think about, for example, gravity. It's the law, 
um, you know, uh, within the scope, within the restrictions of the Earth's atmosphere, right, it's going to be the case that uh, bodies go to ground because of the way that gravity works, right? So all bodies go to ground is true. <laughs> we, we don't think of that as a controversial claim, and we don't really need to iterate every single body going to ground in order to say that the universal claim is true. Once we leave the Earth's atmosphere, however, things become different. All right, so that's a file away. Um, now, let's come back to something that we, we have talked about already today, uh, but that we want to not just file away, we want to use as a template. And these are Aristotle's four forms. In other words, remember, we have two types of, of claim in quantifier logic, universal, existential. The two types of claim also occur affirmatively or negatively. So this is what Aristotle would call the quantity and quality of a claim. So let's look at what the standard logical notation is in our version of the system for each of these claim types. First, universal affirmative is typically going to be reformulated in ordinary English as if anything is an S, then it's a P, or uh, for, for every X, if X is S, then X is P, and the translation looks like this. Now, please note that what I didn't, um, um, hold on just one second. Oops, good one, Mia. Erg. Doesn't matter what the color is. What I didn't do is this. I didn't put in this slide the parentheses around each of the variables, which is what we see in our in our um, text. But that's only because I just wanted to provide you with as clean a visual as possible. You know, and as parentheses start to fly around, you know, our visual field gets a bit cluttered. Okay, so that's our universal affirmative. That's our standard translation. When translations get complicated, what you're going to want to do is think about whatever, whatever is the relevant uh, standard as your baseline, as your template for translating. No SRP, that is the universal negative, it can be restated as, as, this, as follows. If anything is an S, then it's not a P. Or for every x, if x is an s, then it's not the case that x is a p. Translation. Now our two existentially quantified sentences. Some SRP can be restated as something is both an s and a p, or there exists something that thing is an s and a p translation. And then finally, some S are not P can be restated as something is an S and not a P, or you could say there exists something that thing is an S, but it's not the case that that thing is a P. And I'm sort of reading it a little bit more than is actually in the sentence. Okay, so Let's go back to what we have been working on. We remember that we moved from talking about atomic sentences to compound sentences. And when we uh, worked in compound sentences, we talked about standard translations, right? So, so how do we uh, translate a conjunction sentence when we're talking about conjunction as the main connective? How do we translate a disjunction, blah, 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 right? Well, what you're looking at here on this slide is standard translation for universal and existential sentences or universally quantified and existentially quantified sentences, affirmatively and negatively. These are going to be your go-tos. How are we doing? Thoughts?
And P.S., guys, the good news is um, even though there's a lot of interesting and sometimes, you know, complicated stuff for us to think about, as soon as we get through um, this, for, so let me back out of that. For, for, for the purposes of your confidence level in terms of your thinking about kind of what's left in the semester, as soon as we get through chapter nine, you have in principle everything you need for the, for the remainder of the semester. And that's because when we get to derivations, it's going to be the case that you're going to see intro and a limb rules for universal and existential quantifiers. You already know what it means to talk about uh, an intro and an LM rule, right? In addition, the vast majority of your work when you're working on uh, derivations and quantifier is going to involve stuff you already did in chapter six and chapter eight. I know you're so choked up with happiness that that you you can't speak. Yeah, but Lewis is clapping. Awesome, thank you. Okay, um, I want to. I think. Hold on just a second. Let me see if I'm right about what I'm saying. Yeah, I want to just finish up with talking about the notation um, uh, of these sentences in terms of equivalent ways of. Uh, talk of, of saying things, right? So how can we say the same thing from one sentence to another in quantified, uh, in quantifier logic or in quantified sentences? And then we'll look at a little bit of translation, but then we're going to start just practicing. So we'll go into Tarski's world. So um, you notice uh, there's that biconditional symbol Right? We know that biconditional means, you know, is one and the same as in the sense not of identity, but in terms of says the same thing as or is equivalent to. Go back to your truth functional understanding of the biconditional, right? When you say this, you're also saying that and vice versa. So uh, take a look at the first uh, uh, sentence. All SRP says the same thing as it's not the case that there's something that's an S but not a P. No SRP says it's not the case that there is something that's an S and a P. And we'll simplify the equivalences as we go on. Um, and what I mean by that is we're going to look at quantifier equivalences from the standpoint of atomic sentences and um, negated atomic sentences, as opposed to uh, sentences that also include the arrow and the conjunction. Something is an S and a P says the same thing as, it's not the case that nothing S is a P. And then finally, and I'll give you some ordinary English examples in a sec, uh, there is something that's an S but not a P says the same thing as it's not the case that all S are P's. So bear with me. Let's go back now to the, the first example, right? Every S is a P. What if we say something like uh, all dogs are animals, right? All dogs are animals says the same thing as it's not the case that there is even one dog that's not an animal. It's a little mouthy, I know, but I hope that makes sense. How about no SRP? No chickens are rabbits is equivalent to saying it's not the case that there exists even one chicken that's a rabbit. How about some SRP? There is at least one person who likes logic. So there is at least one person who likes logic. 
is equivalent to saying, it's not the case that no one likes logic. And then finally, something, uh, sorry, rephrase, uh, there is something S that's not P, can be something like this, uh, there is one dog that is not a poodle, is equivalent to saying, it's not the case that every dog is a poodle. How are we doing so far? Again, we'll talk about equivalences that are um, just sort of visually simplified. So let me give you an example, and then I'll, we'll come back to this later. But you can take a quantified sentence, so in this case, the universal affirmative, and the universal affirmative is logically equivalent to saying, and now notice we're, we're going to have a negation on each side of the existential. And I'm just grabbing P as the placeholder predicate. Right? So everything is, is equivalent to saying it's not the case that something's not. Right, so as we go forward, we'll look at we'll look at what I've just written in blue with the with the quantified sentences for each of our uh, equivalences. Am I right to say that everybody can see Tarski's world? Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, so let's um, build a world in which the first sentence is true. So, um, as a reminder, you're going up into your uh, buttons, but of course there are, sh there are short keys, sorry, keyboard shortcuts uh, that you can use if you, if you want um, for our quantifier sentences. So, here's how we're going to notate. For everything, oops, sorry, for everything, that thing is a cube. Is that kind of an awkward way of putting it? Yes, but I'm just type, I'm uh, speaking out or I'm speaking the um, notation. I'm gonna uh, erase or delete the ordinary English sentence, but you'll remember it. And if we click the TF button for this uh, line, we get a T. And we know why, right? That's because if we're talking about Tarski's world being the entirety of, of what we can talk about, it is the case that everything is a cube. What do you guys think right now, given the world, is sentence true? It's sentence true. <laughs> is sentence two true or false? False. False. Yes. Thank you, Ivan. Sentence two is false. Why? Because... The sentence says everything is a large cube, but we can see from what what Tarski's what we built in Tarski's world and the fact that um, the small size button has been highlighted and so grayed out that it's actually not the case. It's not true that everything is a large cube. So, but let's go ahead and now translate. So now, what are we talking about? We're talking about two classes of thing. Right? We're talking about cube things. Oh, sorry, large things and cube things. Things and cube things. We need parentheses, right? And we need the quantifier, right? So as Ivan points out, sentence two is false. What do you want to do to make the sentence true, do you want to adjust the world or do you want to adjust the notation? Your choice. All right, so make the world 
such that both sentence one and two are true. What do you think the difference is between what was said in sentence two and what's said in sentence three? So let me let me tell you, let me go back here. In other words, when you see the ordinary English of number two and you see the ordinary English of number three, do you conceive the sentences differently? And if so, how? Yes, because you're going to flip large and Q. So it's going to be Q X and large X. Okay, so, so one difference between them is the order. Um, but what if I did this, Kate? And you might say, Mia, that sentence is really, really ugly. Like, what? nobody writes a sentence like that. Like, what? what so what I'm asking you is this. What if the order of the uh, predicates in number two is not the defining, for, for our purposes right now, is not the defining distinction between two and three? Well, three, you can have a small dot up and it would still be true, I think. Okay, yeah, so Mike says, so, so, so Kate, your, your, your thinking is really, really good and you don't want to lose that. Um, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But as, as Michael says, if we want to have something other than a large cube in our world, right, number three is going to effectively express that for us. So it's not the case that two and three have to say something different, but it strikes me that when I say everything in this world is this versus every object has this property, every object of this sort has this property, part of what seems to be implicit in what I'm saying is that there could be other objects. So, so let's just mess around with this and see what, see what we get. Oops, sorry. Right, so does everybody remember our um, does everybody remember our standard translation for the universal affirmative? Number two doesn't look like the standard translation, does it? But does it also make sense to say that number two says something different from number three, given the way that I've translated two and three? Yes. Yeah. So, Lewis, does it make sense to say that the only thing your translation is missing is the set of parentheses, parentheses around cube x, arrow large x? So, let's remember what we said at number two, everything is large. And then at number three, every cube is large. Now we're going to introduce a small dough deck. And we're going to say there is something. The thing is small. And the thing is a dough deck. And by the way, Kate, please don't forget what you said before. Oh, oopsie. Please don't forget what you said before about ordering the order of large and cube because we do need to talk about that, okay? Oh, I did it again and again and again. Okay, it's true. Now, question for you guys. Given what we've just done, remembering what our sentences said, um, what do you think 
we're going to get when we hit the TF button for the, the entire set of sentences? Do you think all are going to come out true? No. no. Right. Okay. So does it make sense? I think number one is easy peasy to see, right? It's not true that everything is a Q, but does it make sense why two is false but three is true? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. So we know, Kate, that if we swap the positions of the predicate large and the predicate cube at line two, there's not going to be any difference that that uh, that swap makes to what the sentence means, right? No, just line three. Right. But that said, is it still true that everything large is a cube? I mean, if we were to swap the the predicates in line three, it, we'd still get a, a true sentence, right? Uh, it still works in our benefit. Right. Three and four are kind of dependent on each other. They both can coexist. But one and two, those are the only two sentences to get all. Oh, I see. Right? Once I introduce yet another cube. Yeah. Right? So look, so, so Kate, what you were saying is exactly right. So now let me, let me, let me, uh, uh, throw that cube away. Sorry, cubie. Okay. So three is true. And you, if you swap right? You still have a true sentence, but that's because we've only got that, that single cube, right? And, it, and it's large. But remember when we introduce another object, right? When we swapped the places, or sorry, when we go back to our original, number three is going to be false. Do we know why number three is true when we introduce the cube now? Um, so, yes, number three is still true even despite the order. Good. But if you go to four and make the small large, then three would be false. Because everything large is a cube. So if it, there's a large dojo, it wouldn't make sense. Good, good. Beautiful. Okay, so um, one of the things that, that uh, we have just been doing is what is a version of what we would do uh, if we were to play the, oh no, here's the game. Yeah, this is the game button, right? Yeah. I don't play the game hardly ever when I'm not working in quantifier logic. I, I personally don't find playing the game super helpful given the way that my mind works. Some of you will say that you've played the game only because an exercise in the textbook told us to, and you didn't really find it helpful. Some of you will say, I love the game. It's really helped me understand stuff. If you haven't played the game or you haven't, or you've played it and you, and you haven't found it helpful, don't give up on, on the game because you may find that it, in doing what we just did, if that's helpful to you, you'll get the same sort of process in uh, the, the game um, uh, part of the program. So that's just a for what it's worth. Um, I also find coming back to Tarski's world in quantifier logic really, really helpful to understanding what it is to talk about the scope of a quantifier or to talk about the domain of discourse. Because Tarski's world is so restricted, right, it really helps me. I've got this sort of finite, um, uh, um, a, a finite universe, and I can, and I feel like I can manage compassing it mentally, intellectually, much more easily, uh, and it seems possible in ways that, that regular life doesn't. Okay, so let me pause right there um, and ask you guys first how you're doing.
What do we think? You're loving quantifier logic, am I right? It makes sense. Lewis is clapping good. We're just adding everything to what we've already learned. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, um, here's a question for you. Before we move into looking at some um, textbook exercises, um, is it the case that some of you think, oh, man, I find this much more intuitive than uh, what we were doing before. Why didn't we start with this? Um, and it's not like you couldn't start with quantifier logic, but this, what, what we follow, the, the process that we follow is the standard process. Um, that said, let me also say that if you say, oh, I really like this, um, but I'm still struggling with some stuff from chapter six and chapter eight, the good news is that stuff gets pulled up into chapter 13. Moreover, if you're having any struggles with um, uh, translations, again, you've, you will have used uh, the, the bulk of the notation already in chapter uh, three and then again in chapter seven. Okay, so far so good. 